My name is Roger Lee. Uh, I work at Battery Ventures, and, beha and on behalf of all of my uh, colleagues that are here, we are thrilled to be one of the co-hosts today. Uh, it's an honor to be part of this, this conference, and just we're really excited to be here. Uh, also incredibly grateful that all of you are here. Uh, as you heard your own say, there's almost 600 people coming today, which is incredible. Um, and the fact that you guys are committing so much time and energy out of your schedule to this event is obviously a, a great sign. Um, so as you, as you heard also, we've got an amazing lineup of speakers, so today is just gonna be a super day. Um, I'm gonna get things kicked off here with a presentation called The State of Marketplaces in 2019. And this is a pretty ambitious topic to try and cover in an hour, let alone the next 25 or 30 minutes. But we're gonna, get, we're gonna give that a shot. And there's three key topics I'm gonna try and cover. Uh, first is why do investors like Battery love marketplaces? Why do we invest in marketplaces? Why do marketplaces create so much value? Second, what are some interesting trends going on in marketplaces these days? And then most importantly, as we look back over the past year in 2019, what are some lessons learned from what happened that we all as investors and as entrepreneurs can take forward into 2020 and make sure that we're, we're building the most successful companies possible? So let's dive into it. This is some quick legalese. Um, and then before we get into the meat of it, huh, our map is not showing. Maybe we'll advance. Nope, that's funny. On the left there, that's supposed to be a, a global map. So I'm um, not sure why that's not, not showing in the slide. Uh, but quick, uh, quick backstory on Battery. So we're a 40-year-old venture capital firm. We manage uh, roughly $7 billion. Our current fund is $1.25 billion. And we're totally stage agnostics. What that means is we'll do anything from investing a half a million dollars to a million dollars in an early stage entrepreneur as they're getting their business off the ground, all the way up to doing a 50 or $75 million growth equity or pre-IPO check. Uh, most importantly to this group, we are um, uh, we operate with a, a pretty global footprint. So we have four offices. This is where the map is a little deceiving. Uh, we have four offices uh, in the United States, and those two offices on the right are meant to represent uh, Europe. And so we have an office in London and one in Israel, both of which cover Europe. Roughly a third of our portfolio is in Europe. And Berlin is actually now our fourth or fifth biggest market worldwide. I think we now have six or seven companies in Berlin. So investing in Europe and investing in Berlin is a core part of our, of our strategy. All right, this is my favorite slide. I love this slide. We love marketplaces, and we invest in a lot of marketplaces. So over the last 10 years, we've invested in over 20 marketplaces. And you can, as you can see on here, they span a whole range of use cases from kind of e-commerce marketplaces like Wayfair and StockX and Groupon to content and community marketplaces like 90min and Glassdoor to uh, local services marketplaces like Angie's List, travel marketplaces like Hotel Tonight, Omeo, and Get Your Guide, and uh, financial services marketplaces like Coinbase. So in total, over the last decade, we've invested almost $400 million. And if I had to guess, over the next decade, we'll invest at least another 400 million. I should also emphasize, again, building on my point a minute ago, European marketplaces are a core part of our strategy. So you'll notice 90min uh, is located in London. Uh, both Omeo and Get Your Guide are here in Berlin. And so, and actually, um, uh, the, the presentation right after me is my partner Itzik interviewing Naren, uh, the founder and CEO of Omeo. So it'll be a great discussion and I think we'll all benefit from hearing, hearing about that journey. Uh, but the key takeaway here is that we're very active investing in European marketplaces and just super excited about continuing to invest in, in marketplaces going forward. So that, that begs the question, why uh, why do investors love marketplaces? Why does Battery love to invest in marketplaces? And the simple answer is, is that we are looking for businesses that can fundamentally change the world. And in order to do that, you have to impact a consumer's behavior, their lifestyle on a day-to-day -day basis. And when you look at the impact marketplaces have had over the past couple decades, they've done that in spades. I think the best way to describe this is to walk through the day in the life of the average consumer over the last couple of decades to give you a sense as to what role marketplaces have had on their day-to-day -day activities. So if you go back to, uh, this is uh, Chloe, young woman in her 20s back in the 90s. And back then, there really was only a couple of marketplaces that were available that Chloe could use. So she might use eBay every once in a while, a couple times a year to buy and sell some goods, might use Craigslist to find an apartment, but it was pretty episodic and she'd use these services maybe a couple of times a year. 
Fast forward to roughly 10 years later, and we have Sarah. And Sarah is now uh, using these services probably, you know, a few times every quarter. She might be going to uh, Yelp to get restaurant reviews. Maybe she's booking her travel at booking.com and using Zillow and Trulia to buy and sell a home. But it's becoming more frequent and she's using it a handful of times, um, you know, every single quarter. Um, the real inflection point, though, happened over the last decade. And we have our very hip looking, um, Berlin resident Tommy here. And Tommy uh, is using these services literally on a daily basis. Uh, in fact, Tommy would have a hard time surviving without these marketplace services. Uh, all of his transportation is provided by Uber and My Taxi and Blah Blah Car. He's getting his food delivered from uh, Takeaway or Just Eat. Uh, he's getting all his entertainment from uh, from Spotify and from Netflix. He's traveling the world using, you know, booking and Airbnb. He does his shopping through StockX and through uh, Farfetch. And so uh, he's literally using these services every day and spending hundreds, if not thousands of euros every single month across all these different services. And some of you in the audience may be saying, you know, is this really what's happening? Is this really how millennials are living their lives? And I assure you the answer is yes. And in fact, I have a 15 year old son. He's a sophomore in high school. He lives his life like this. And so it's not, uh, you don't have to wait until your 20s. These services are actually getting embedded into the lifestyles and into the behavior of kids even as young as, as teenagers now. And so, this kind of begs the question, you know, as these services are becoming more and more popular and as they're getting embedded into people's behavior, what does that mean for us as investors? Well, it means it's creating a lot of value. And I think the best way, again, to describe this is to snapshot it over those same three timeframes to give you a sense of how much value it's created. So go back to the initial time frame I talked about 20 years ago, and the only publicly traded marketplace back then was eBay. And most people in the, in the room may know this, but, but perhaps some of you don't. But back when eBay went public, it was an iconic IPO. It was seen as one of the best venture investments in history, created tens of billions of, of, uh, of value for the founders, the employees, and the investors. And it was just a wildly successful company and kind of opened people's eyes as to what a successful marketplace could look like as a pub public business. Over the 10 years following that, you started to see the first wave of international marketplaces start to go public. So you saw a couple more in the US with Netflix and Expedia. You had uh, C Trip in China. Uh, you had Rakuten in Japan. Uh, you had uh, bookings here in, uh, in Europe. Uh, you had, um, what else? You had uh, Mercado Libre in Latin America. So this now opened people's eyes globally. This wasn't just a US phenomenon. This was a global phenomenon. And these marketplaces were, were getting real scale. Uh, embedding themselves in the lives of consumers and creating a lot of value for all the participants. The real inflection point, though, happened over the past decade, where we've had over 30 marketplaces go public, creating roughly $3 trillion of value, and such trillion with a T, so a huge amount of value. And these are iconic companies around the world. It's Alibaba and JD in China. Uh, it's uh, Spotify and Just Eat and Takeaway uh, here in Europe. Uh, it's uh, Groupon and Wayfair and uh, Yelp in the United States. Um, it's Make My Trip in India. I mean, these are businesses that are fundamentally changing how uh, these huge incumbent industries operate, like food and transportation and logistics and entertainment. And they've created just an enormous amount of value over that time frame. And then in this past year, in 2019, we had five more marketplaces go public. So we had Uber and Lyft, uh, The Real Real, Fiverr, and others. And so there's been just an enormous amount of momentum, an enormous amount of wealth creation. And when you go back to that core question, why do investors like Battery like marketplaces, it's very hard to find categories that create trillions of dollars of value in a matter of a couple of decades. And so when we look for interesting opportunities, and I'm sure all the entrepreneurs in the room look for interesting opportunities, this is what gets all of us so excited. Now. With all that said, as great as marketplaces are and as uh, compelling as they have been as a category in investments and as much wealth has been created, and even all these great IPOs we had in 2019, this past year was actually kind of rocky for marketplaces. It wasn't all like up and to the right and it wasn't all unicorns and rainbows. 
And to, to kind of describe this, this is a picture of me um, at our sister event uh, back in San Francisco in March. And I'm on stage, very similar to right now, and I'm espousing all the virtues of marketplaces and saying how great they are and how much wealth they create and how everybody should be starting a marketplace and we love to invest in marketplaces. So very similar narrative as I'm walking through. And as you see on this slide here, I'm talking about some marketplaces that are gonna go public in 2019. And I got a couple of them right. I've circled Uber on here. Um, I've got Lyft right, Airbnb, it looks like maybe it'll be next year. But I also made a bunch of mistakes. And you'll see, you know, I have the WeWork circled as one example. And so a lot of the predictions that I made as recently as nine months ago did not come true. And if you actually look back over the past nine months, a lot of marketplaces really struggled. And so this begs the question, you know, what happened, you know, during this past year and how did marketplaces really perform uh, over the past 12 months here? So I think the, the best way to, the best way to, uh, to, to discuss this is to use something that, that we talk about internally a lot, that's the Battery Marketplace Index. And this is an index of the world's uh, largest marketplaces globally. And in order to qualify, uh, you have to be publicly traded in one of the major stock exchanges around the world. Um, and you have to have a market cap of over $500 million. If you do that, there's 41 companies that now qualify for this. And historically, the marketplace index has outperformed the NASDAQ pretty handily. So if you look back, uh, we went back seven or eight um, uh, years here. And up until about this past March, uh, it had done very well. So it was up roughly 200% during that time frame versus the NASDAQ, which was up 150%. So it outperformed it by 50 percentage points. However, um, if you go to the, the bottom right of the slide here, starting in March, which is around the time I was at the other conference and making all these very grandiose, uh, very excited statements about the success of marketplaces, the marketplace index started to tank. And it went uh, in the opposite directions, the NASDAQ. So if you, you look at the data on the bottom right here, the battery marketplace index dropped roughly 4%, and the NASDAQ during that same time frame was up almost 12%. So about a, a 16 percentage point difference between uh, the performance of the marketplaces and, uh, and the NASDAQ. In dollar terms, what that means is that these marketplace companies lost $120 billion of value over the last nine months. So a ton of value was destroyed uh, over this period. So that raises the question, what happened? Like WTF, why, why did these, this entire category struggle over the last nine months? And what can we potentially learn from it? So we look back and we uh, spent a lot of time kind of diving into these, these different companies to figure out what were the key lessons. And there's a lot, there's a lot more than three, but in the interest of time, we're gonna talk about three today. And so the key ones are first, your business model matters. Now this may sound really simple, but in a post we work world, this is super important. Number two, it's a very subtle point around the heterogeneity of supply and what impact that can have around building a marketplace that has a real kind of deep moat and structural advantage that can't get commoditized. And I'll explain what some of those words mean in a couple minutes. And then three is the emergence of regulators. Uh, this is not the Wild West anymore when you can afford to ignore regulators. Regulators are getting more and more active and present with marketplaces and so you have to keep them in mind right from the get-go. So let's talk about uh, lesson number one, your business model matters. And I think the best way to describe or walk into this one um, is to, to talk about it in the context of what the world has been like over the past four to five years. And if there's one word that describes kind of the investor mindset and the entrepreneur mindset over the last five years, it's growth. All we were looking for was growth and all entrepreneurs were asked to deliver was growth. We would hand you a bunch of money, you would grow really quickly. If you burned a lot of money, nobody particularly cared. We'd hand you more money just under the assumption you'd continue growing. And that worked great and everybody was very happy. Until about Q1 of this year. So if you go back to the, again, that roughly that March time frame at the last conference, investor sentiment started to shift and investors started asking very different and very pointed questions. So instead of just how fast can you grow, they'd ask about how efficient is your growth? Tell me about your metrics. What does it cost to acquire a new customer? How long does it take to break even? What's the lifetime value of one of your customers? Um, things like that. And if entrepreneurs couldn't answer those questions really crisply and really effectively, one of two things happened. You either couldn't raise money, or if you could, your valuation got hammered. 
and so we've got a couple of examples here that some of you may be familiar with, but I think will we'll be, um, we'll be good kind of uh, case studies and, and lessons for potentially how not to do this. So the first one is Uber and Lyft. And this time last year, so a year ago, November of 2018, people were saying, uh, couldn't have been more excited about Uber and Lyft's IPOs. They were seen as these iconic companies. There's going to be unlimited demand when they went public. A uh, huge amount of enthusiasm. Thought they were going to perform incredibly well uh, once, they, once they got out. And lo and behold, when they um, uh, filed their S-1, and that's a document you file with the, the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission, and that is a, a public document that discloses all of your financial performance. Investors, for the first time, got a real look into how the companies were performing, and it raised some fundamental questions about if these businesses would actually ever be profitable, and if they would, would it be a, a, actually an, an interesting company? Did they have really attractive unit economics? Now, both companies were able to go public, but if you look up here, since they went public, they've both underperformed. Uh, Uber, their stock price is down roughly 30% since their IPO, and Lyft is down almost 50% since their IPO. These are two of the worst performing IPOs in the last five years, and the key lesson is is the investor community lost confidence in their ability to build a viable, profitable, long-term business. And so their, their evaluations have been hit as a result. Now, the real poster child for this is WeWork. And I'm sure many of you have been following the whole WeWork saga because uh, it's been widely reported. But WeWork raised a ton of money, billions and billions of dollars. Um, their last private round, kind of before everything collapsed, was about $50 billion. They also filed an S-1 last summer, hoping to go public. And then the world was exposed to their financials. And it raised a lot of questions about just the viability of the business. And investors saw just how fragile the model was. They saw the ballooning losses. And the entire house of cards of WeWork collapsed. So the CEO got fired. Um, they had to shelve the, uh, the IPO. And their, their primary investor, SoftBank, had to come in and bail out the company. In the matter of three or four months, they lost 80% of their value. They lost $40 billion of value. And in the 19 years I've been doing this, I've never seen a company lose so much value so quickly as the result of investor sentiment shifting on that business. Uh, and again, the key lesson here is they simply weren't able to convince investors about the viability of the, the long-term business model. In fact, um, uh, Masa from SoftBank, who uh, is, a, is a brilliant, wildly successful person, uh, who, you know, prior to this whole episode, I think uh, it, it was a really just amazing investor. Um, you know, at his earnings call with SoftBank a couple of weeks ago, he, he showed this slide for uh, the WeWork, to, to kind of talk about WeWork profitability. I'm not kidding. This is literally the slide that he used in his deck. Uh, and there's two huge problems with this slide. The first, is that the X and Y axis have no metrics. <laughs> it's really hard to discern what he's talking about. Uh, the second is that there's a lot of emphasis around words like hypothetical EBITDA. And at some indeterminate point of time in the future, you'll notice the word future at the, the bottom of the trough here. Um, and so investors have simply lost patience for this type of business, ones that have hypothetical earnings or potentially become profitable at some indeterminate time in the future. Uh, and as a result, if you can't answer these types of questions, you may suffer a similar fate as we were. I should also emphasize this isn't just happening to private companies with a history of losing money or with questionable business models. This is also happening to public companies who have long, successful, you know, profitable businesses if they get into product categories that investors have concluded are either commoditized or are very capital intensive. And so the two examples on here are Zillow and Grubhub. In the case of Zillow, uh, about a year ago, they got into a business called Instant Offers, and that means they actually buy homes and take inventory risk. Um, investors have concluded this category, by and large, is relatively commoditized, really capital intensive, and as a result, their valuation multiple, their revenue multiples we're, we're describing here, has dropped by 50% over the past year. In the case of Grubhub, Grubhub used to run a wildly profitable, incredibly efficient marketplace, just connecting restaurants with uh, consumers, and the restaurants would take care of the delivery. A couple years ago, they decided to get into the delivery business themselves, 
And this is uh, also largely uh, perceived by investors to be a very commoditized, very capital intensive uh, category with uh, Uber Eats and DoorDash and Postmates all raising billions of dollars with very, very low margins. And they've seen a similar dynamic where their, um, their revenue multiples drop by 80%. In fact, during this period of time, they went from being a $13 billion company to roughly a $4 billion company. So they've lost almost 75% of their value as a result of getting into a really commoditized category. Okay, so lesson number one, what are the key takeaways? First and foremost, just be conscious of the fact that investor sentiment has shifted a lot and that it's really important to recognize it's not enough just to grow fast. You have to grow efficiently. You have to understand your core metrics. You have to understand your path to profitability. And even if that means at times slowing down on growth to run a much more efficient playbook, it's the right thing to do. Okay, lesson number two. Um, so this lesson has to do with supply. And the key takeaway here is the more heterogeneous or diverse your supply is, the more, um, uh, the stronger your business is and the less likely it is to get commoditized. And I think the best way to describe this is in the context of a counterexample. And I'm going to pick on Uber and Lyft again here. Um, and so my example here on the slide is um, I pulled up both apps. I'm in downtown San Francisco and I need to get to San Francisco airport. And as you can see from the results using both of the apps, the experience as a consumer is almost indiscernible. In one case, I get there a couple minutes earlier, I save a couple bucks, uh, Lyft is the better option, so I choose Lyft. However, literally like an hour or two later, Uber could win this battle, um, and I kind of use the two interchangeably. But they're basically commoditized, and I as a consumer don't really care what service I use. And you could argue, hey, that's great, you know, the consumer wins, and these guys are kind of fighting each other and keeping one another honest. Isn't that really, you know, best for the consumer? There's truth to that. The problem is, for Uber and Lyft, it's terrible. Uh, they have been totally commoditized, and I don't care who the driver is. I don't care what the car is. I just want to get to my destination as soon as possible. So this puts them in a very precarious spot where the only thing they can compete on is pricing and marketing. And typically, that is a recipe for burning a lot of money, destroying a lot of value, and a race to the bottom. Another, another example of this is Grubhub. We, again, I hate to pick on, on these guys, but um, it's a similar dynamic. As they got into the delivery business, again, highly commoditized. I don't care who's delivering my food. I don't care you know, what kind of car that person's driving. I just want to get the food as quickly as possible. So that whole category has also been commoditized. And what this is measuring is Grubhub's EBITDA margin over the last five years as they got into this business. It went from roughly 25% and projecting to be about 5% going forward because of how capital intensive and commoditized this category is. As I mentioned before, during this time frame, their, um, their equity values dropped by almost 75%. So what's an example of a company doing this well and a category where differentiated or heterogeneous supply works? And, and I would argue uh, vacation rentals is a good one. And Airbnb in particular uh, has done a great job in this space. And the best way to think about this is think about the demand for uh, going on vacation, how you would structure that query. And there's typically you know, four, five, maybe six different variables you'd think about. It's the type of accommodation you want to stay at, uh, how much you'd be willing to pay, the location of the place you'd be staying, um, any amenities, the duration of stay. Uh, and so there's a huge amount of variability there. So just to use San Francisco as an example, I might want to stay in a single bedroom in downtown San Francisco for one night and willing to spend $50 all the way to I want a, um, uh, an apartment, uh, in South of Market, I'm willing to spend a couple thousand dollars for a single week, all the way to I need a full house in Noe Valley for a month because I'm there visiting family or something. And so there's massive uh, distribution of demand. And the only way you can meet such heterogeneous demand is with heterogeneous supply. And in the early days, it's really hard to match it because you need a ton of inventory in order to meet all the demand criteria. But if you can actually get to a point of scale and have all of the heterogeneous supply, you get this great network effect happens where you can meet increasingly more of the demand, you can drive better conversion rates and better yield, and that will then drive more supply, which in turn drives more demand. And if you do it really well, you can get a monopoly at the end of the day, or at the very least, kind of a winner take most outcome. Monopoly is kind of a dirty word, but you can get a, an outcome where you, you have dramatic, like oversized control of your market. And if you look at the numbers for Airbnb, 
it, it bears out. So uh, this is the, the, their Berlin inventory. So you can see they have 16 times more, um, it's not even homes, just kind of uh, options, 16 uh, times more options in Berlin relative to their, their next closest competitor, HomeAway. And it's not just Berlin. If you look at all the, the major kind of metropolitan markets, it ranges anywhere from 5 to 15x more inventory that they have. So how did they pull that off? What, what did they do tactically that allowed them to have this monopolistic outcome and aggregate all of this heterogeneous supply that gave them this really deep structural advantage? And I'd argue they did a lot of things, but these are three key things. The first thing they did is they made pricing really attractive for the supply base. They knew that if they could lock down supply and remove as much friction as possible, that would give them the structural advantage. So they charge literally ha less than half of what HomeAway charges. So if I'm a homeowner, I'm much more incented to push all of my demand through Airbnb. I'm incented to promote Airbnb, and eventually I'll put, do all of my business through Airbnb because I make a lot more money. The second thing they did, which was ingenious, um, this is kind of the inventory one on the side there, is they created their own type of inventory. They created the fractional home. Before Airbnb, there was no notion of me like sleeping on somebody's couch. There's no notion of me just getting a bedroom. The, the unit of a home was actually like the only way I could, I could rent a place. But then when they divided the house up, if I ran a search for I just want a couch or I just want a bedroom, the only results of that search came up were Airbnb. So they controlled all of this inventory, which gave them a lot more liquidity for their marketplace and allowed them to, to spin the flywheel faster. The final thing they did is they focused on where all all of the, uh, the demand and supply is, which are urban centers. So the average city is going to have like five to ten times more supply than the outlying suburbs or some potential vacation spot nearby. And so again, they had more um, supply density, more demand density that gave them more liquidity and gave them a structural advantage in, in building out their marketplace. And so economically what this means is that they created almost ten times more value than HomeAway. So at their last private round, Airbnb was worth 35 billion. HomeAway was acquired uh, by Expedia a few years ago for roughly 4 billion. And if I had to guess, when Airbnb goes public next year, it'll be worth 50 billion plus. And they are literally running the table globally. They've won the United States, uh, they've won Europe, and they actually have a shot at winning in China too. And I can't think of a single company that I know of that's actually won all three of those markets. Again, compare it to, to Uber that has a really well-funded competitor, at least one, if not two or three in each of the markets, because their supply base is so much more commoditized and it's so easy to compete with them. Okay, final lesson. Um, I'm sensitive, I know we're running short on time here. Um, you have to be conscious of regulators. Uh, over the last couple of years, regulators are, have started spending a lot more time uh, looking at different marketplace businesses and putting uh, legislation in place to help well, they would argue help, um, uh, manage them. And so I've got a few examples on here. Uh, the most recent one uh, is a piece of legislation that's being uh, drafted in California. It's called AB5. This would force basically all gig economy companies to um, reclassify their part-time workers as full-time. And this would have a hugely negative impact on the business models of Uber and Lyft and DoorDash and all the other companies that are using part-time labor. So it's not exactly clear how this one is going to shake out, but it, it could be a really big deal and there's a huge amount of effort going on behind the scenes to try and, and uh, draft this legislation appropriately. In parallel, there's a bunch of states uh, behind this. So in the last week alone, New Jersey has, is going after Uber, asking them to, to uh, pay them $600 million in misclassified employee uh, taxes. And so expect to see more and more activity on this front. The second one you're seeing um, are some cities starting to put caps on the number of uh, ride-sharing uh, cars that are available in a city at any one time and controlling literally the size of the market. We're also seeing this in the, uh, in the scooter market, in the micro-mobility space, where some cities are dictating how many uh, bird and lime scooters are available. So cities are now trying to get more con control of what their actual micro-market looks like and how many cars or scooters are actually available to use. 
And finally, um, in the trust and safety arena, we're seeing more and more regulation around background checking of the actual uh, labor force themselves. This could be the Uber drivers, it could be the babysitter on care.com. Uh, if they're worried about lax standards for whether or not you're doing the appropriate background checking for the person that may have um, some sort of exposure to you or your child. And so you're seeing more and more regulation uh, come down the, um, uh, in the trust and safety space. Okay, so quick summary. Um, key takeaways here. Again, your business model matters. As I said before, in a post-WeWork world, it's not enough just to go grow quickly. Think about efficiency. Think about your metrics. Know your KPIs. Be able to walk investors through a path to profitability. Um, think deeply about your supply base. If there is a way to get more heterogeneous, more differentiated or unique supply, it will make your business stronger and you'll be less prone to commoditization. And finally, be aware of the government. This isn't the Wild West anymore. It's not when, it's not like it was with Uber uh, when they were building their business five years ago and to kind of trample all the regulators. You have to embrace them. You have to be conscious of them. Otherwise, uh, it's going to be a potential risk for you. So, um, even though there is a lot to be learned from 2019 and there were some challenges in terms of how marketplaces performed, we still are incredibly bullish long term. Uh, we believe that, that amazing businesses are being built today. And even though there's roughly $3 trillion of value in public marketplaces now, we think over the next five years, there could be another few trillion as more and more companies start getting, or continue to get built, more companies go public. And our, our real hope is that we have the chance to work with, with some of the people in the room here um, because we think you guys are building companies that will make this current generation you know, look kind of boring by comparison. And so there's a bunch of us from Battery here. There's eight of us. Uh, we'd love to meet with you. We'd love to talk to you. Hopefully, we'll have the chance to work together. And with that, I'm going to hand it off to the next presentation, my partner, Courtney, uh, and she will introduce the next presenters. But thank you for your time and attention.